Huh? I don't know. I guess the seats were never lost. How is everybody this morning? Praise the Lord. It's, it's a blessing to get to come together as one body, to worship the Lord together, uh, to sing praises to him. Listen, I often will say this, but I think it's important that we, that we talk about it from time to time. The truth is that uh, when we're singing, when we're worshiping the Lord, uh, often we can just look at it as like a time of just singing, right? We can think about it that way. And I think I've shared this with you guys before, but we, the first time Shayla and I went to Calvary Chapel in Palm Harbor, we were running late. And on our way there, she said, well, do you want to just go to a different church that starts a little later? And I said, no, it's okay. They got 30 minutes of singing anyway. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I felt about it, right? That's, that's what I thought about it. But the truth is that this is something eternal that we're doing. We're actually not just singing, although we are singing together as one, but we are worshiping God. We're worshiping him. We get to enter into his throne room, and it says in the word that that's, that's ministering unto him. That means that the God who created all things, who created you, that breathed breath into your lungs, that holds your very breath in his hand, that every moment that you live is borrowed time from this God, you get to bless him and serve him and minister to him through singing, through lifting your voices to him, through praising him. That's a blessing to him. It's something that you get to send forward into eternity. And so often, you know, uh, the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, the things that you do, everyday things in your life, are carnal, they're temporal, they're temporary. They, they, they're here one minute, gone the next, and that's it. But worshiping the Lord is something that lasts forever. It's something that lasts forever. Not only that, we get to do that eternally in his presence. We get to worship him. And so as we worship the Lord, as we sing unto him, we're joining together with all the saints throughout all of history that have lifted up their voices to him. That we get to sing in unison, in chorus, with the angels, with the seraphim, with everyone who's surrounding the throne of God right now, and the halls of heaven echo with your worship. That's an amazing consideration, is it not? It should be. It should be amazing. So anyway, this morning, turn with me real quick to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to be in Acts chapter 26. You guys know how we do. We just go through the word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We've been working through the book of Acts. So here's the thing. If you don't have a Bible with you, raise your hand. And someone will bring you a Bible, okay? It's important that you have one. It's important that you have one because we just study the Bible. That's what we do. You guys don't care about what I have to say, and you shouldn't. You shouldn't care about my opinion, okay? You shouldn't care about uh, whatever seven easy steps to a happy life that I could give you or whatever nonsense people are preaching nowadays from pulpits. The truth is you want to hear the word of God. Dustin, right here in the front, there's one right here. George's got it. You want to hear what the word says, right? Jesus says this about the word. He says, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. That means it endures forever. Listen, I really, truly, genuinely believe that for all of eternity, for all of eternity, that we'll be learning of the depth of God's word and the richness of God's word. If God is eternal and he is infinite, and he is an infinite resource of love and majesty and mercy and grace and power and righteousness, and his word is also infinite, then that means you can never come to the end of the knowledge of it, that you will be forever learning. That's exciting. That's exciting to me because I love learning about the word. I love studying the word. I love being in the word. And so it's important to me and important to the Lord that you have the Bible in front of you, okay? And as you have the Bible in front of you, open with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And as you guys are opening there, I want to invite all of the families up that are dedicating their babies this morning. I want to invite them up with their babies. My kid is the only kid sleeping. So, I just want to share with you guys something really quick. This is our first baby dedication of Calvary Chapel, Crystal River. I'm, it's a, like, listen guys, I promise, if this is your first time here, I am not a crier. I'm not, I promise, I, I genuinely mean that. I'm not a crier, but uh, 
if I do cry a little. <laughs> Don't hold it against me, okay? I want to read something to you from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Listen, it's important that you recognize that we don't baptize babies. We don't do that. And the reason why we don't do that is because baptism is an outward expression of an internal truth. It's something that happens inside you when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You make a decision to follow him. And then baptism is an outward expression of that. You're baptized uh, in ordinance to show the world that you belong to Jesus, right? That's what it is. That, it, it's an ordinance given to us by Christ so that the world knows we belong to him. A baby dedication, however, is really the parents pledging to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's really us, as parents, dedicating our lives to raise them in the word of God, to raise them in the truth of who he is. And so I want to read something to you from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 3. I'm sorry, I'm in verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in verse 6 he says, And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. Okay? So we hide the word of God in our hearts. It means it transforms us. It makes us new. It changes us from where, where we were living with this hard stone into this place where we have a heart of flesh and we live for him. Okay, it transforms our life. It transforms who we are. And so we hide that word in our hearts. Verse 7, it says, you shall teach them diligently. You shall teach the words that God has given you diligently to your children. Listen to that. This is the charge for every parent. This is the charge for every responsible parent to their children. That you should teach diligently the word of God to your children. Now, I want to make that clear because it's very important. It's very important that you understand the privilege that is given you as a father or a mother. It's a privilege. A, a child is a gift from the Lord, an inheritance from him. Happy is he who has a full quiver, right? Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. It's an amazing reality. And yet the Lord gives us these miracles and he says, now here's what I want you to do. Teach them the truth. Teach them the word. It's, it's your responsibility, all the parents that are up here today, it's your responsibility and grandparents, it's your responsibility to teach the word to your children. It, it's a charge given to you by God. Teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets, frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So let me ask you a question. How often or when is it appropriate for you to start teaching your children the word of God? Like right now, right? Is it, is it good to wait like maybe for a Sunday to bring them to church so they can hear it from the teachers in the children's ministry? No. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. But you know what's beautiful about it? Is that the Lord brings a family around you. The Lord brings his body together to help you on this journey. We're here together. This is, this is it. You guys know how I feel about kids. You guys know how I feel about the children's ministry. I genuinely believe that this is the most important ministry that happens in this church. Much more, much more important than the teaching from the pulpit, much more important than anything else that goes on, much more important than the worship is the pouring into these kids. They are facing struggles that we as parents, we as adults, never faced in our life. And yet the word of God applies directly to them where they are right now. And so our responsibility as parents is to what? Teach them the truth. I think about you know, reading through the book of Joel and all this terrible stuff that came on the nation of Israel. And what does Joel tell the people of Israel? He says, tell this to your children. Tell them about it. Not just the easy things. And listen, as, as parents, sometimes it's easy to just go through the motions and to point to say, you know, you're going, everybody's going to heaven. Everybody, you know, God loves us all. We're all God's children. Whatever the cliches are that we say as parents. But the truth is, we need to teach them the word of God. And if you don't know it, you can't teach it. And you can't lead someone somewhere where you're not going. You can't do it. 
If you're not heading in the direction, you can't say, follow me because I'm going there. You have to be headed in that direction yourself. And so it's important for us as parents to not only be ready and willing to teach the word of God to our children, but to live our lives according to it. To submit ourselves to the truth of what God said in his word. To walk in accordance to it. And if you don't know it, you can't do it. So I want to take a minute and I'm going to let all the fathers introduce Fathers and grandfathers introduce these children to you. Um, we didn't get a microphone ready, so they have to talk into my shirt. <laughs> Hello, how are you all doing today? Those of you who don't know us, I'm Dana, and this is my wife, Stefania, and our beautiful little baby, Eleanor. How, how old is Eleanor? Eleanor just turned five months on the 20th of this month. I saw you look at Stefania like, oh, I, hope I'm, I hope I'm right about this. Hi, I'm Corey, and this is my wife, Vanessa, and this is Olivia May. My name is Jack, and this is my wife, Melissa, and this is our grandson, Titus. My name is Steven. <laughs> this is my beautiful wife, Chayla, and this is our youngest son, Judah, and he is... He's 21 months. 21 months. Almost two years old. Hey there, my name is Dylan Ethington. This is my lovely wife, Katie Ethington. This is our oldest, Aubrey. She's 22 months. And this is our tiniest one, Abigail, who just got back from heart surgery. She's eight months. So, with all that being said, I want you guys to welcome back Dylan and Katie, their first Sunday back. We've been praying and seeking the Lord on behalf of Abigail. And as she went to go see, uh, have heart surgery, open heart surgery, but the Lord was with her in it. The Lord has bound them together through it, has strengthened them, purified them through this uh, trial and hardship that they've gone through. And uh, she's a little miracle here with us. So we're just praising the Lord for her. But if you guys would join me together in prayer as we pray over these kids. Corey, if you could pass out these certificates. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for these children. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that uh, you've brought them into our fellowship. Lord, we're thankful uh, for the miracle that you've given us all. Lord, we want to glorify you in it. Lord, we don't take this call that you've given us lightly. Lord, we want to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. We want to recognize, Lord, that you've given us a ministry. Lord, it's not just for us, it's for you. It's to bring you glory. It's to add to your kingdom. Lord, this is your plan for kingdom growth, to keep giving us children. And so, Father, I pray right now a special blessing over these families. Lord, that you would protect them from the cares of this world. Lord, that you would guide them through the battlefield that we're on. Lord, that you would equip them as warriors for your kingdom so that they could pour love into these kids. Lord, I pray for these kids that you would put a hedge of protection around them as they walk through this world. Lord, I pray that you would bring even more good and godly examples of what it looks like to be submitted and in love with Jesus, that you would introduce them into their lives even more and more. I pray that even through these children, Lord, that you would use them as a ministry tool for people who don't know you, that they would see the love that these parents are sharing for their children and it would call them into your presence, God. Lord, I pray even right now, in the presence of all these witnesses here, Lord, with all their agreement, that you would bless these kids. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A round of applause. Yeah. Which, who's going to take it? Okay. All right. Mom, can you take a picture of all of us? We should have maybe sorted that out beforehand. Everybody scoot in. Oh my. Short people in front. All right, everyone look. Smile. All right. Praise the Lord. Everybody give him a round of applause. All right, you guys can go down. I needed that. <laughs> yes. 
All right, turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Open your Bibles, Acts chapter 26. I'm excited this morning, guys. I'm excited to share with you from Acts. I think I say that every morning, every Sunday. I think I'm excited, but specifically and especially for Acts chapter 26. I want to remind you of the context of where we've been. I want to remind you what's been going on up until this point. Paul is in custody now in Caesarea, okay? He was taken into custody in Jerusalem for the preaching of the gospel, right? He was taken into custody in the temple as he was going through this system of purification with these men who had taken a Nazarite vow. Is everybody on the same page with me? Everybody remember what's going on? And so as they were there in the temple, they took Paul custody. There were, there were some Jews there, religious Jews from uh, Asia. They see Paul. They take him custody. They cry out, this is the one. This is the guy who's perverting everything. This is the guy who's preaching against uh, the Jews. He's preaching against the temple. He's preaching against Moses and all of that. Untrue. And so they don't just take Paul into custody. What do they do? They start beating him to death, right? They want to beat him to death right there at the temple. And so the commander of the Roman military that's there in Jerusalem at that point comes. He rescues Paul. He takes Paul out of there. He asks the crowd, what are you beating him for? They don't know. One person says one thing. Another says another. They don't know why they're beating him. They just want to beat him to death. And so he's taken into custody. He comes before the Sanhedrin. He gives testimony before the Sanhedrin. Again, Sanhedrin wants to kill each other. And so they send him away. This Roman uh, commander sends him away uh, to the governor. Felix. And so he comes to Felix. Felix doesn't want to make a decision. He calls the Sanhedrin together. They come. They testify against Paul. There's no proof uh, to say that what they're accusing him of is true. And so Felix says, look, we know he's innocent. We should let him go. But for fear of the Jews, for fear of those in power, he doesn't do it. He keeps him in custody for two years. And he says, look, when, when, there's, a, when there's a better time, I'll bring you back. I'll hear from you again. Well, two years goes by. There's no better time. And so he ends up leaving the position as governor, and then Festus comes in, right? And then the Jews approach Festus, and they say, hey, why don't you kill this guy? Why don't you get rid of him? Bring him to Israel while we have assassins lie in wait for him, and they'll kill him. And he says, no, you guys got to come, go through the trial, go through the same thing. And so when they come, again, no proof. And yet, what does he do? He keeps him in prison. Then King Agrippa comes. King Agrippa is this king of, uh, of a client kingdom. He's an appointed king. It's pretty confusing. Ultimately, Rome is in charge, but they allow him to be king of this small region that is under the rule of this Roman governor, Festus. And so he comes. Now, he's an expert in all customs and law of the Jews, right? He's an expert in that. He is a pagan king. I just want you to know that. This is Herod Agrippa II. He's a pagan. He is not a Jew. He's not really an observer of Jewish law. He's not really a worshiper of the true and living God, but he wants to be a part of this, and so he's accounted as an expert of all things Jewish-related, right? And so they bring him in. He comes in. He's visiting. And you can imagine that Festus is pretty confused as to what's going on, so he asks Agrippa. He tells him about Paul, and he says, yeah, they came. They accused him of all these things that I didn't really care about. I didn't really didn't have anything to do with me. It's about their own law and this certain Jesus. And, he said, and then King Agrippa says, well, I want to hear. And so there's this great pomp, this great ceremony. They bring Agrippa in. There's all the noblemen from Rome at this point, all of the commanders of the armies that are there in Judea at this point. They all come together, and there's this great ceremony, this great show of pomp. And they all take their seats, and then they bring in the prisoner. They bring Paul in to testify of himself. They bring Paul in to tell them about what's going on. So that's where we leave off. Chapter 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. Now I love this. I love this, I love this scene. Remember, all the perceived people of importance, all the people who are supposed to be important are all gathered together there. They're all in their best clothes. Uh, there's a, a great ceremony as King Agrippa comes in in his crown with his sister Bernice, who is also his wife. We're not going to really get into that. It's weird. Just know that it's weird, and Agrippa is a weird dude, okay? So he comes in with his, uh, with his sister wife, and 
you know, great celebration for him. They sit down. Everybody's bowing down to him. And then they bring in Paul. And at this point, Paul is in chains. He's in chains. He's the prisoner. But I want you to recognize that in that room, Paul is the most important person in that room at this point. Why? Why do I say that? Because he's the only person in that room equipped with truth. He's the only person in the room that knows and worships the true and living God, the one in whom their next breath is. That's, what, that's how Daniel puts it, right? As he's speaking to Belshazzar, who was going to fall that night, Daniel says, you have not honored the God in whom your next breath is. Whether or not you acknowledge him as God, whether or not you worship him, it does not change who he is. He is the God of heaven, the creator of all things, the Alpha and the Omega. Paul comes in, the only one in the room who knows that. And he comes in to share that with the world, with at this point the most important people in all of Judea, King Agrippa and Festus. Now he comes in, he's in chains, he motions with his hands, he picks up his hands to the crowd to show his chains. He says, here I am in chains. He's going to defend himself now. But what I love about this is Paul's real ministry, Paul's real purpose in this moment is not actually to defend himself. Paul is not concerned with his freedom and liberty. I, I need you to hear that. That is important for us right now, sitting in this room, where we're gathered together in the United States of America. It is important for you to hear that Paul's most important thing on his mind right now is not his freedom and liberty. That doesn't mean that it's not important to Paul, but it's not the most important thing to Paul. It's not his freedom and his liberty. He's not fighting for freedom. Paul recognizes, and he'll write about it later in his prison epistles, that he is a prisoner of Christ, not a prisoner of Rome. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And guess what? He writes that from prison in Rome. And he says, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. My chains are in him. The best the world can do is chain my body, but in Christ I'm free. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The same power that rose him from the grave is the same power that is at work towards me even right now. That's an amazing reality. And so Paul comes into the room not really worried about his freedom, but wanting to preach the gospel to a lost crowd. And so Agrippa says, look, you're permitted to speak. So Paul in verse 2 says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa. Because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews. Especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore I beg you, hear me patiently. So Paul appeals to King Agrippa, right? He says, look, you're an expert. You know all these things. You know the law. You know the prophets. So I'm begging you, hear me out. Hear me patiently. Because when you do, you'll understand. It'll all make sense. If you know the word, if you really are an expert in all these things, when I tell you the truth that I'm about to tell you, it's going to make sense. So hear me out. Now, I want you to remember that up until this now, every single time Paul has shared his testimony in the gospel with those who are in power, they never hear him out. Never. Never. He gets to a certain point and everything erupts into chaos and they take him into custody again. They want to kill him again. They beat him halfway to death again. They imprison him. They strip him naked. They whip him. They beat him. Whatever they do. But they never hear him out. And so he says to King Agrippa, hear me out. Hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of, of our religion, I have lived a Pharisee. Now, Paul was saying, look, all the Jews know me. They all know who I was. Not only that, they're not here to testify. Do you see that little subtle dig that he puts in there? If they were here to testify, which they're not. I've lived in the strictest sect of our religion, a Pharisee. That means he strictly observed the laws of Moses. All of the laws and the prophets, all of the word of God, all of the Old Testament, he observed in a strict sense of the word. Not only did he just uh, look at it as the word of God or he just kind of give a nod to it, but he actually lived his life according to what the word says. He's saying, I lived strictly according to the law as a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God our fathers. Made by God to our fathers. 
Verse 7, to this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. So what is Paul saying that the Jews are actually accusing him of? What is he actually on trial for? He's actually on trial for the hope of the Messiah. That's what he's saying. Look at what he says. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. That's what I'm on trial for, for the hope of the promise. Now, what promise is he talking about? Well, in Genesis, God speaks to Abraham. And when he speaks to Abraham, he gives him a promise. And he says that through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He's talking about the Messiah who will come through the lineage of Abraham. And in him, all of the nations of the earth will come back into recognition of who the true and living God is. Now he's saying it's because of that hope, that promise, the hope in that promise that I'm on trial for. Now you want to know what's amazing about that? Is it says that Abraham, when he was given this promise from God, believed him. He believed God. It doesn't say that Abraham believed in God. I mean, that goes without saying, right? Abraham was talking to him. I'm sure he believed in him. But here's the reality. Abraham believed God about that promise. And when he believed God about that promise, it was accounted to him as righteousness. That means by belief in the promise, by belief in this promised Messiah, by, faith, by placing his faith in the Messiah who was to come some 2,000 years later, 3,000 years later, after this promise was made to Abraham, it was by belief in that promise that Abraham was accounted righteous. You know what's awesome? It's by belief in that promise that you are accounted righteous. Not by believing in God. You can believe in a nameless, faceless God, and often people will say, I believe in God, and they think that that's enough. It's not. It's not. You have to live in submission to that belief in Jesus Christ, in the promise, in the promised seed of Abraham. And Paul is saying it's because of the hope that I have in that promise that I'm on trial before you today. Verse 7, he says, To this promise are twelve tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused by the Jews. Verse 8, Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blasphemy. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now think about what Paul is saying. He's saying it's because of this hope in the Messiah that right now I'm on trial before you, King Agrippa. But even I myself persecuted this movement. Even I myself came against the church. Look at what he says. I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints, I shut up in prison. Verse 10, I shut them up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Now, this is why I believe Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin. This is why I believe he sat on the council of the Sanhedrin, because he actually voted against the Christians. He actually cast his vote against them so that they would be killed. Remember at the martyrdom of Stephen, the first martyr of the church, who sat there and consented to the martyrdom of Stephen? It was Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle. So listen, wherever you are today, Paul was worse. Wherever you've fallen short of the glory of God, wherever you've sinned and fallen short of his glory, Paul was in a much worse state. He was killing Christians. And not only was he killing them, but he was compelling them to blasphemy. Now what does that mean? He was compelling them to deny Jesus as Lord. Now, I want you to think about this with me for a second. This is first century Judea, okay? Christians are routinely being killed by, for their faith. Now, what would it take? What would it take in first century Judea where when you become a Christian, you know, you know that it's probably going to cost you your life? What would it take to cause one of them to deny Jesus? 
can't even imagine. And Paul is saying, that was me. That's what I did. I compelled them to blast me routinely by the edge of a sword. I compelled them to deny Jesus as Lord. And what's crazy is Paul said, I thought I had to do it. Look at what he says. Verse 9, I, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Not only did Paul do it, but while he was doing it, he thought he was serving God by doing it. He thought as he killed Christians, as he put them in prison, remember what it says is he was hailing them off to prison, women and children and men. He was hailing them all the way to prison to stand before the council of the Sanhedrin to be put to death for their faith in Jesus, and he thought he was serving God through it. I even persecuted them even to foreign cities. Remember, on his way to Damascus with letters from the high priest saying that he could bring Christians bound to Jerusalem. Verse 12. While thus, I, uh, while thus occupied, occupied with this mission of persecuting the Christians, with this mission of going to Damascus to bring them bound to Jerusalem to stand trial, while thus occupied, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. And at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I want to pause there for just a second. I want to think about this scene, right? This is now the third time in the book of Acts that we've read this, this Damascus Road experience, this conversion experience of Paul. Now, what that tells me is your testimony is important. The way the Lord rescued you is important. It's effective. It's powerful. In fact, in heaven, in Revelation chapter 12, an angel proclaims of the church that they overcame him, speaking of Satan, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So your testimony is important. But I also want to point out to you, how does Paul start? He starts with the word of God. He starts with the truth, the objective truth of who God is. He starts by appealing to the scriptures, right? This God who we've worshipped, the promise that was given to our fathers by God, the promise of this Messiah, the hope in this promise that's been promised from the time of Abraham, that's the hope in that promise that I'm being on trial for. So he starts with the objective truth of the word of God. It's not just about his experience, it's not just about his feelings, it's about the truth of God's word. And then he appeals to his testimony. He says, look... I was persecuting the church. I hated the church. I thought I had to destroy the church. And then on my way to Damascus, I have this crazy experience. A light shines brighter than the, new, than, than the noon sun. A, a light of glory shining from heaven. I hear a voice speaking from heaven to me. Now, what does that say to Paul? That says that whoever's talking to him is talking to him from glory. He's not talking to him from hell. He's not talking to him from the grave. He's not talking to him from obscurity. He's talking to him from glory in heaven. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting uh, this sect of the Nazarenes? Why are you persecuting these heretics? Why are you persecuting just these people who are uh, confused? He says, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? Now, I want you to think about that phrase for just a second. Paul says, who are you, Lord? Paul knows that that voice speaking to him is speaking to him from heaven, with authority, from glory. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. You're persecuting me. It's not the church. It's not the people. You're persecuting me. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Think about what that means. And I would imagine in a group this size that there are people here right now that are kicking against the goads. You know what that means? A goad is like a prod. It's like a spike that they would prod animals along with, right? And an animal would kick against the goads when they didn't want to go in the direction of the prodding. They would stand back and kick against the goads and it would cause them to be bloody. It would poke them. It would pierce them. It would slice their skin. And it was a way to get them to go. And he says that right now, Paul is kicking against the goads. That means that the Holy Spirit has been drawing Paul. 
Saul of Tarsus at this point. He's been drawing him into faith, and he's been resisting. He doesn't want to go. And the Lord says, it's hard for you, isn't it, Paul? It's hard for you. It's hard to kick against the goads. Listen, that's what you're doing. If you're in your life right now and you feel the Holy Spirit pulling on you and saying, I want you in church. I want you in fellowship with me. I want you to come to the recognition of the truth of God's word. I want you to cry out to Jesus as your Lord. And you're saying, well, I'm going to wait for a better time. Like Felix. Listen, there is no better time. Today is the day of salvation. Here's the truth, and you know it. Every single person in this room has suffered loss unexpectedly. Every single person in this room knows that you are not promised tomorrow. You're not promised. The only moment that you're promised is the moment that you're in right now. You're not even promised your next breath. Remember what Daniel says. He says, you haven't worshipped the God, you haven't honored the God in whom your next breath is. The fact that you're breathing right now is the common grace of God extended to you saying, come. Won't you come? Fellowship with me. I've made a way where there was no way. I've made a way for you to enter in to communion with me. A holy God who is without blemish. A holy God who the angels in heaven can't even look upon. As they stand before the throne of God, they cover their face from the glory of God. And they cry out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. The whole earth is filled with his glory. That God, the God who is so holy that the sinless angels can't even look upon him, wants fellowship with you. He wants to spend time with you. He's beckoning you to him. He's saying, come. Come. Paul, in recognition, he says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, verse 16, he says, but rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. That's a, that's a powerful verse, verse 16. It's a powerful verse. Why? Because in the glory of God, what happened to Paul? He was blinded. He was knocked off his horse. He's flat on his face before the God of heaven, right? Before this glorious appearance, he doesn't even see him bodily. He just sees the glory of God, the light of God. It knocks him off of his horse. It puts him flat in the dirt. He's actually blind. He cannot stand in the presence and the glory of God. And then, as he appears to him, and he says, who are you, Lord, expressing his belief in his voice from heaven. And Jesus said, it's me, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And we're not told this, but Paul says, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And then in verse 16, God, speaking from heaven, Jesus, in his glory, says to Paul, stand on your feet. That's awesome. Why? Because it is by faith in Jesus that you are enabled to stand before a holy God. It is only, only by faith in Jesus that you are enabled to stand in the presence of a holy God. Do you remember Isaiah in that same scene of the seraphim covering their face before God and saying, holy, holy, holy? Remember before that, in all the previous chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah, being a prophet of God, is going out into the nation of Israel. And what is he saying? Woe is you who do this. Woe is you who do that. He's woe in everybody. Woe to you for this. Woe to you for that. Woe to you and woe to you for all falling short of the glory of God. Then he steps into the presence of God. He sees him in his glory. And what does he do? He says, woe is me for I am undone. Woe is me for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in a people of unclean lips. When Daniel, who we never read of his sin... Daniel, sterling in character, when he sees God, he falls down as dead. And yet Paul is sinner. Saul of Tarsus, the one who was persecuting the Christians unto death, compelling them to blaspheme at the edge of a sword. He falls on his face before a holy God. And then when he places his faith in Jesus, when he believes in him as Lord, he says, stand on your feet in my presence. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. Same with Isaiah. When he falls down, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. An angel comes with a coal from the altar and purifies him. And then God says, Who will go for us? Who will plead our cause? And he says, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Paul says, What should I do? Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, 
to make you a minister. Now, that word minister, we kind of glorify that word. We make it out to be this great word. Like, I get to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what a minister means? Servant. Paul's a servant. He's a slave. He's bought with a price. He belongs to Jesus now as his Lord. That's what that word Lord means, right? It means master. So Paul is a servant. I've appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a slave, a servant, and a witness. Now, that word is an important word as well. A witness, like we think about someone in a court case, right? And they come to testify, and that's a great example for us. It's a great example. We come to testify to the world of Jesus. But I want you to know that that word witness is where we get the word martyr. Is where we get the word martyr. So God says to Paul, stand on your feet because I've appeared to you for this purpose to make you a slave and a martyr. It's like, oh, great. Thanks a lot, Lord. I was a man of prominence. Here I am with position, with authority, with power to go and to bring these men bondage into captivity, back into Jerusalem to stand trial before the Sanhedrin, whom you've appointed, God, and here you are now appearing to me to make me a servant and a martyr. Now, I want you to recognize that Paul is eventually martyred. He's killed for his faith, right? He's beheaded by Nero. But that's not when Paul becomes a martyr. Paul becomes a martyr right here. Right here. Paul becomes a martyr because he lives a martyred life. What does Paul say often? He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul says, I die daily. I pick up my cross. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross, follow me. Paul says, I die daily. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That means... Right now, as he calls you into faith in him, it's not so that he can be your co-pilot, so that Jesus is my homeboy, and I can add him to my life, and I love the life I live, but I just want to add Jesus to me. Jesus says, come and die. Amen. Come and lay down your life at the foot of the cross and live for the kingdom of God, because this life is a vapor. It's here one minute and gone the next. All the moments that you live on this side of heaven, whether you live for a hundred years, when you step into eternity, it is the first dot on the infinite line of eternity. The greater portion of your story is where you live in eternity with a holy God. And the only things that remain from this life are the things that you did for him Amen. and the people that you poured into and the worship that you gave him. That's it. That's it. It's only that. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. To make you a minister and a witness. Both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I, have, which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people. As well as from the Gentiles. To whom I now send you. To open their eyes in order to turn them from the darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. And an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Man, that's powerful. That's powerful. What is it that Jesus said he was going to do? He said he was going to separate Paul from the world and cause him to be a witness and a servant. Cause him to be a martyr and a servant for the kingdom of God. He said, I'm going to deliver you from the people that I'm sending you to. I'm sending you to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Paul says that he was an apostle to the Gentiles to provoke the nation of Israel to jealousy. That's why. Okay. And so Paul, uh, Jesus, speaking to Paul, says, I'm going to send you to them so that when you preach the gospel, they can be forgiven of their sins. That's the purpose. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. Think about that for a second. He's saying, I'm sending you both to the Jews who are God's chosen people that are near to him, that have close proximity to God, that have the temple given to them where the glory of God dwells, where his very presence is on the, on, on the, on the mercy seat. He says that I'm going to send you to them so that even their eyes, who perceive themselves to be near to God, will be opened and that they'll turn from darkness to light. Now, who is it who is exempt from this? No one. No one. There is... None righteous. No, not one. None who are good. None who seek to do the will of God. The most effective lie that the enemy has ever told the world is that God wouldn't send a good person to hell and you're a good person. 
Well, it's very true. God would not send a good person to hell. The only problem is there are no good people. I mean, I, that's harsh, right? That's hard, to, that's hard to hear. It's hard to receive. But ultimately, when you judge yourself by the world, you seem pretty good because your sin is never very ugly to you. Other people, on the other hand, you can point out their ugliness right away. But you have to judge yourself by the standard of a holy God. And what is his standard? Perfection. Are you perfect? No one in the world would say, yeah, absolutely, I'm perfect, right? No, everyone would say, well, no, nobody's perfect. That's the point. That's why Jesus had to die, because there is none who are perfect. And to stand in the presence of a holy God, you must be perfect. He cannot be in the presence of sin. He cannot have sin in his presence. Therefore, you have to be sinless. And because you were born in sin, conceived in sin, and brought forth in iniquity, you cannot stand in the presence of the holy God without the atoning work of Jesus. It's him who equips you to stand in his presence. It's him who equips you to say, stand on your feet. And so he goes to the Jews. He goes to the Jews to bring them from darkness to light. He goes to the Gentiles to bring them from darkness to light. Now, what does it take? What does it take? What is, what is his message to these people? What does it take for them to step out of darkness into the glorious light of Jesus Christ? What does it take? It takes trying really hard, right? Getting all the, all the rules together, making a list, and making sure every day you're checking off all the rules of that list so that one day God will like you enough to let you into heaven, right? No way, man. You can't do it. That's the purpose of the law is to show you that you can't do it. What does it take? It takes standing in the righteousness of Jesus, the one who lived perfectly for you, the one who did the work for you. Remember what he cries out in a loud voice on the cross. It is finished. To telestai, paid in full, nothing else needs to be done. When you come to a recognition of that truth, when you place your faith in him, you are sanctified and set apart from the world. You are bathed and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. All of the muck and the mire that you picked up from the world has been washed away, and you are robed in the righteousness of Jesus. So that now, when the Father looks upon you from heaven, he sees you as perfect in his son. Perfect. Now, that's hard. That's a hard truth to reconcile in my heart because I live with myself. I live with myself every day, and I see all the ways that I am messing up every day, all the ways that I'm short with my wife or my children, all the ways that I fall short of his glory, all the ways that I lose my temper about silly things, all the ways that I fall short. I am intimately aware of them. And yet it says in Hebrews that he has perfected those who are being sanctified. That's you. Perfected those who are being sanctified. That means from the perspective of God in eternity, you are perfected in Christ. Now, that's an already and not yet kind of scenario, right? There's a, a practical working out of that as we live in this life and we recognize that we're being sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. Better today than yesterday, better tomorrow than today, hopefully, right? But that's what he says. An inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, sanctified sounds like a religious word. It sounds like a holy word, right? Sanctified just means set apart. It means they are being set apart from the world to me. And how is it? By work, by striving, by, by trying really hard? No, it says it right here. By faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea. And then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. It's because of that. It's because of the preaching of the gospel that they seized me to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. He's saying, this isn't anything new. I'm not preaching something new. I'm not telling you about some new idea that I came up with. I'm being persecuted and on trial before you because I'm preaching those things that God and Moses both said would come. Jesus is not a new idea. 
He was a lamb led to slaughter before the foundations of the earth were even laid all the way back into Genesis chapter 3. In the fall, in the garden, God pronounces a curse on Satan and he says, as he's, as he's pronouncing to the woman, he says that I will put enmity between your seed and his seed. You will crush his head. He'll bruise your heel, but you'll crush his head. It's all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 that God pronounces judgment on Satan. He said it's going to be through the seed of the woman, through this promised seed that is to come, through the Messiah, that the head of the serpent, Satan, will be crushed. Now, when is that going to happen? I can tell you, because I know I've read the story, it's already happened. It happened at the cross. Jesus defeated death and Satan at the cross. He is a defeated foe. Now, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour even now. But the truth is, history is written already. He's defeated. He's done. God said it would happen, and so did Moses. That the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. <coughs> now... As he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, so picture the scene, right? Here are all these people gathered together. He says, all right, King Agrippa, be very patient. Please hear me out with patience. I'm going to tell you the truth. He begins to tell it. He's getting into the heat of it. And then what happens? Festus cries out. He interrupts Paul right in the middle of it. He cries out with a loud voice. Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Now, remember, Paul is a learned man. He's a, really a, a, a genuine genius, right? And so... Festus is saying, you've lost your mind. All this reading books has driven you crazy, man. You're, you're out of it. What are you talking about? Jesus coming in and rising from the dead? I, this doesn't make any sense to me. Now, remember, Festus is a Roman, and in fact, he doesn't even know about Jesus. Remember what he says about Paul? He says that he's preaching some certain Jesus. He's never heard of it. He doesn't know anything about it. And he says, look, you're crazy, man. <laughs> you're crazy. And then Paul says... But he said, I am not mad, most notable Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. He says, I'm not crazy. I'm speaking the words of truth and of reason. Now, what does that mean? It means that what he's saying is true. And it's not true to him. It's important for you to understand. In the world that we live in, this post-relativism, this post-relativistic society that we live, that we live in, People will say, well, hey, look, what's true to you is true to you. What's true to me is true to me, and that's all good. That's what makes the world go round. It's great, man. As long as you're not hurting anybody with your truth, and I'm not hurting anybody with my truth, it's all good. Well, that's stupid. Okay, that's stupid. You've know, you got to know that's stupid, right? There is a law of non-contradiction in the universe, right? If I say something that contradicts what you say, we can't both be right. There, there is no such thing as two things that contradict each other that are both true. It, that's, that is a logical impossibility. And Paul says, what I am saying to you is truth. It is the objective standard of truth in the universe. This is true. Not only is it true, but it's reasonable. It's reasonable. So Paul is saying that this righteousness that I stand in that I have access to by faith in Jesus, that now I stand in the righteousness of God. I stand and worship the hope of glory through the Messiah that was promised to us before the foundation of the earth was laid, that Moses spoke of and God declared from the beginning of time. I stand in that hope, and it's reasonable. God doesn't ask us to take a leap of blind faith. He never asks us that. You guys realize what the Bible is. I say it often. I go through it all the time. It's important for you to know the Bible is a collection of historical documents. Not only historical, but they are reliable historical documents, okay? It's a collection of 66 books. It's not just one book written by one person. This is written by over 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years in three continents and three different languages, and it tells the same redemptive story from beginning to end without contradiction and without error. It is the perfect revealed word of God. And he says that as you read these things and hear these things, it's reasonable. It's reasonable to believe in a holy God. It's reasonable to believe in a creator of all things. Now, we live in a time where they will say that is unreasonable. 
But if you've ever actually given yourself to the study of God's word and the reliable historicity of the Bible itself, you will know that it is reasonable. I've, I've, had, I've had conversations with atheists that go something like this. Well, I've read the Bible and I just don't believe it. First off, when they say that, I don't believe them. Because a lot of times they're very intelligent. And the truth is, if you are, you're way too smart to read the Bible and to not believe it. You're way too, you're way too smart for that. When you read it and actually give way for the Holy Spirit to counsel your heart and actually read it for what it says, you will believe it. It's axiomatic. That means it's self-proving. That's a mathematical term. When it means something that is self-proving. The Bible itself is axiomatic. It bears witness to itself. The Holy Spirit bears witness to it. It bears witness to itself. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And it's not an argument. It's not circular reasoning to make that argument because it's many sources, 66 different sources, drawing from all these different sources, from this whole entire spectrum of time, from all these different people, kings and peasants and slaves that wrote it, and yet it is perfect. Paul is saying that this faith is reasonable. Oh, guys. We're out of time. You guys don't have anything to do today, right? We just won't have a song at the end. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. Listen to what he says. No, no, Festus. I'm not out of my mind. I'm not mad. This is the truth, and it's reasonable. And the king, whom I'm giving testimony to, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. He's saying, look, this was done openly. King Agrippa knows about it. He knows all these things that I'm saying are true. And then he addresses King Agrippa to his face. Now, this is a man who can put him to death. This is a man who is actually holding Paul's life in his hands at this moment, right? And he addresses him face to face. I can imagine the tension in the room as everybody around them is silent, right? Everybody's looking at Paul. Everybody's looking at King Agrippa. And Paul is standing flat on his feet and staring right into the eyes of King Agrippa, standing against the tide of culture where you recognize that in the room that he's standing, no one there believes him. They all want him dead for what he's saying. Everybody wants him to just, you know, hey, listen, you can believe in God, but don't mention Jesus, okay? It'd be a lot easier. Paul is saying, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach it. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And he stands there and he looks at King Agrippa and he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. I know you believe it. Now look at what King Agrippa says. This is the saddest verse maybe in the whole Bible. And then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am except these chains. And when he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with him. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But I want you to back up with me for just a moment. Paul pouring his heart out before these pagan kings. Paul pouring his heart out before this Roman governor and all the Romans of pomp and circumstance, all the ones in authority there in Judea that are from Rome. Paul pouring out his heart and pleading, and he said, I would to God that you would be like me. I would to God that you would believe in Jesus. He's pouring out. He's telling them the gospel. He's pleading with them. And King Agrippa says, you almost got me. Man, I was so close, so close, Paul. Listen, if you're in that place today where you feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, where you hear these words and you know that they're true, listen, Romans 1 says that every man, all men, know there is a God. They know it. They know it. Now, what do they do with that knowledge? It says that he, that he is revealed in nature. Even his eternal Godhead and power declares the glory of God. They know there is a God, but what do they do? They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They push that down within them. They don't want it to be true. 
They don't want to have to come under the authority of a God who is right all the time. They don't want to have to come under the authority of God who knows what's best for them. King Agrippa knew what Paul was saying was true. He knew it. And he was unwilling to let go of his life. He was unwilling to lay it down. He was unwilling to follow God. Listen, if you're in that place right now, I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. Lay it down. He's good. He's a good father. You're not going to lose anything. You're going to gain everything. Everything. Before I was a Christian, I didn't want to go to church. I thought it was stuffy and silly. And I didn't want to stop doing the things that I thought I was free to do. And the reality is that when I became a Christian, I recognized that I was bound to them. I was, it's not that I was free to do the things that I wanted to do. I was bound to them. I had to do them. And I was set free in Jesus. I'm pleading with you today, if, if, if you haven't come to that place where you've accepted him, if you haven't really come to that place where you've laid it all down and, and you feel this tug on your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. He's pleading with you to come. It says for the ages to come that God wants to reveal his glory to you through his kindness to you. He wants to reveal to you the richness of his glory in his kindness to you. He's calling you right now. Won't you come? Like Billy Graham says, won't you come? Today is the day of salvation. You are not promised tomorrow. Let's pray. Listen, if you're in that place, as we pray, just cry out to the Lord. If you're in that place where you want to receive him, just cry out to the Lord. Just acknowledge who you are. Acknowledge that you've fallen short. Acknowledge who he is, that he's done the work for you. Come to him by faith, and he will receive you. There's no one who's too far. There's no one who's strayed too much. The Lord's calling you even now. And it doesn't matter how long you've been away from him. He leaves the 99 to go after the one, and he's pursuing your heart right now. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for the testimony of Paul. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you've brought us into the kingdom of light, that you've rescued us from darkness, that you've pulled us out of the pit, you've placed our feet on the rock of Jesus Christ, that you've given us a new name, that you put a song in our, on our hearts and uh, you've filled our lips with the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless your church. I pray that you would continue to pour out your spirit on them. Lord, that you would bless them with your presence. Lord, that you would call them closer to you. Lord, I pray that we would look more like you as we leave this service, as we leave this place, that we would look more like your son as a result of sitting under your word. Holy Spirit, come, convict our hearts, convince us of the truth of your word by your power, Lord, and it's for your glory and for your kingdom. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, I want to remind you guys, well, Rebecca wants me to remind you guys that we have youth group today, okay? So if you're a youth age kid, come back today. If you have youth age kids, it's at 2 o'clock. Be here uh, and enjoy your time together.